maybe the, the, the Lampard Gerard argument will be revived. How can I be on the same show as Simon <laughs> Jordan? There's going to be a lot of polysyllabic <laughs> nonsense going on here today. <laughs> you, I nonsense have to say, being the key word. <laughs> you did send me a voice message the other day and you said you were looking forward to A, to meeting this man and B, being on with him, Mr. Jordan, right? Well, people tend to look forward to being on with Simon and then feel very deflated about the process afterwards. Oh, they? no, <laughs> never meet your heroes. Don't, no, don't crush me, especially you look good, lovely in that velvet, mate. You're looking Thank good, you. lovely kettle. I tried, to, I tried to keep up with the sartorial elegance I was expecting you to have when you wandered through the door. Oh, my there God, he's gone. A, a hard early challenge, Danny. <laughs> You'd know all about that, mate. Oh, he's dear. gone early. Russell, a lot of people on the, the, the messages are sending out, are you going to have a word off with Simon? I mean, you're both as eloquent as each other. I bought a good one, pleonastic. That means using more words than you need to, Simon. Oh, really? So it's that's one that you're going to require. <laughs> Russell, <laughs> Do you know what? It was back in 2018 in the old Talksport building around yeah. the corner here yeah. uh, that I last saw you. A lot has happened since then. Uh, not least, your podcasts are through the roof. I, I listened to Under the Skin last night, the one you did with Fern Cotton. They, they proved to be enormously popular, very successful. Mm. Uh, you've got a new film coming out, Death in the Nile. Is that right? That's right, I'm in that film, Death on the Nile. Yeah, I'm doing acting in it. One of, the, <laughs> one of the actors that's in that film. Jim, I mean, yeah, Sir Kenneth Branagh. It's a whodunit, mate. It's a whodunit. So, and it's only been out 30 years in various incarnations. Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie, that's right, Simon. It's been 100 years since the book was written, but I'm still, it's, it's a carefully guarded secret, the perpetrator of that. <laughs> Plus, but like, uh, yeah, I do my YouTube stuff. That's where I watch this show. I watch this stuff on YouTube, watch it all clipped up and that. That's how I consume it. But a lot of my mates would listen to it in the radio. Rory, Liverpool fan. Dean, West Ham fan. A lot of people that have driving as part of their work. I know they're listening right now. So a little shout out to them a lot. Nice to hear that they're listening. And you've got this new podcast, Football is Nice. Yeah. Well, and I've had some good people on there already. I've had Frank McAvenny on there. I've had Tony Cotty on there. Carlton Colt. You've seen a Matt Panama. Jensen <laughs> <West> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. I uh, love what's the premise that. behind that? Really, it's talking about the fan culture and the stuff around football that remains beautiful in spite of the ongoing commercialisation and corporatization of the game and the game getting taken away from fans, extracted, and what still remains that's beautiful about the game and a bit of a laugh and a bit of fun. That whole ESL business, I suppose, was interesting in a way that it showed us that people really, really care. Yeah. But like in a sense, the trends that that's a culmination of are sort of present throughout the game and all over it. So, but it ain't like a, it has little moments of a uh, little bit of gas being released there from Simon's <laughs> bottle, which makes a pleasant change. And I mean bottle literally. That wasn't rhyming slang. Um, like, um, like, uh, but like uh, what I'm saying is, um, like, it's talking about stuff that's just fun and some of the stuff that's deep. There must be a reason this game remains so important mm. to us all. Well, exactly, Russell. In fact, these two guys were on with me the morning of the Super League reaction. And it was like nothing we've seen. You remember it, Danny? Right in the middle of that, Mourinho got sacked. I mean, that was a morning like no other. It was refreshing, wasn't it? The coming together of everybody. Yeah. I think it, it stripped stuff back a little bit and made people think about what they appreciate and what they, you know, how they got into loving the game and what it means to them and why it means so much to them in terms of That's the competitiveness. Right. And the, 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 the greed now is, is becoming... I think a lot of people are sick to death of certain aspects of football, but it's still... Rem I mean, the, the, the fact that the stadiums now you know, the difference of the fans being in there compared to how long did we have without them? Probably 10 months, was it? Nine yeah. Months. It just, it shows you, doesn't it, the difference and, and, and the real the real thing with football is the supporters and the passion they create when you, even, I even remember playing from jumping from reserve football to first team football. It just, you, you get so much more out of yourself because of the, the supporters. Yeah. But, and yet you still think, Mr. Jordan, the Super League of a fashion will still happen. <clears throat> oh, of course it will. Of course it will. See, that's the bad news, Russell. Well, there's nothing bad about it. If you, the only thing that was bad about it was lack of meritocracy. What was bad about the it? The competition, yeah. You need to make sure... What's, so who decided that UEFA were the harbingers of all good things in football? They're not. They're a bunch of corrupt crooks. So why should they run the game? Why don't you get a mechanism that enables the monetization of football so that all the money just doesn't go to the snot-gobbling footballers? It has to be balanced out. You have to have some context. It can't just all go to the players, can it? Can it? Russell, where do you stand on these snot gobbling footballers, Mr. Firstly, Man? I love that as a piece of language, snot gobbling. That's a, that's a hashtag. <laughs> it comes right up various there. images, isn't it? 
Well, it certainly did, mate. It was potent. Uh, but what I feel like is, in a sense, the ESL is just an amplification of trends that are already present. The sort of things that I reckon exactly that right. fans should be chatting about is like fan representation on boards, the potential for fan ownership, clubs like oh, FC dear. United and East Dulwich, Hamlet, <laughs> and whether or not it could ever work. I mean, is there a world where great clubs like Liverpool, Newcastle, West Ham United, and the, the, you know all clubs could be back in in the hands of fans run democratically like once again yeah, in like the, the community? Checks out. Well, I wonder. You know, sometimes you see like renationalise the railways, renationalise the water, renationalise football. Well, it's not happened yet. It's not happened yet. But we right. still, you know, they don't give up hope, Simon. Don't oh, give up no, hope. I have That's hope, the main thing. I have hope for fans to sit on board so that they can write the checks as well, so they can feel the pain of what it feels like to be able to bark at people for making the wrong decisions, yet not have the financial consequences behind it. Do you still <clears> feel like a bit of a wound from the whole Palace thing? No, not at all. It's a journey I went on and I chose to go on it. I didn't like the ending of it. Of course I didn't, but I'm a big boy. I took my medicine. The bottom line is I'm also, I was a fan and a football club owner, so I can yeah. see both perspectives. And the idea that you put emotional fans in a boardroom is probably not the greatest one, but fans should be relatively close. You should have shadow boards. You should have people that are meeting with the fans and communicating with the fans regularly. Of but what about when Danny just now goes, like, the, the difference of the fans, like, the fans are actually literally affecting results, literally affecting the energy. Now, I know there's the idea that oh, the, the the fans are emotional and hysterical, but I, I don't believe in that. I don't believe it all has to take place at the level of corporations. I think that football clubs should return to their community Routes, to the shipyards, to the print, to the to the to the places that they come from, to the pits if necessary. I know that kind of I industry agree with you. is there should over. Should be a blue chip above every single football club, like a, a like a blue plaque on the door to respect the values of what it represents. But when you start flying players around the world in private jets and paying a half a bar a, year, a week, you move away from the reality of football once was, and you move it into a different direction. So I don't disagree with you that if if you look at football through one prism, it's about emotion. Otherwise, yeah. people wouldn't watch crap and then go back and watch it the following week and cheer for it, would they? Yeah. Right. So it's all about emotion but it's also about another ugly unedifying commodity money yeah mm. so what mm. would be the restrictive you know in germany the way the the, the well, most of the clubs are owned by the, the supporters investment there. yep investment if you're if, if you give the golden share to the fans yep and you give it 50 you get 50 plus one yeah who's going to sit there writing checks out endlessly to bankroll the desire of their football club to meet the expectations of the fans to meet the demands that the mm. players want and then not have the final say you see we've spoken about this before Russell really, yeah. fans sure they would love to be represented on boards <clears throat> but would they part with their hard earned cash oh. like this fella did when he owned Palace obviously I'm talking about a radically different model not one that emulates the pre-existing the ca Narnia, capitalist yeah. system it's not necessarily <laughs> Narnia not all things that are beautiful and ethereal are impossible Simon it can be done now I know the thing about flying people around in, in uh, private jets from the half a bar a week I appreciate it. and if there's loads of money in the game who should have it other than the players but if I think players felt connected once again to the roots of this game to what they mean to communities to what they represent and what the feelings that they conjure perhaps in this model mate people wouldn't be earning that do? much money do you not think they do Cause I, you, we, I, we I think that they of... possibly do but I think yeah. that the money like you know I, I'm not saying they don't because I chatted to Mikel mm. Antonio the other day the guy's full of heart he's full mm. of you know uh, he's a beautiful footballer a beautiful geezer but what I'm saying mate is that his journey was unique though from Tooting wasn't it so he's got a different yeah. And his journey's been very different in terms of yeah. the lower leagues to the mm. top. What, what I think one of the problems is, sorry, just to interject quickly, is that what happened is from in my development in football, from when I started at Liverpool to the end, the big difference was where I found we lost a little bit of connection and understanding and that togetherness with the supporters was the, the law change. You know, the Bosman ruling and the influx of foreign players. I'm not xenophobic in any way. But what happened is you, you had players coming in and as you do now, there's, I mean, I don't know what the percentage difference is in terms of local lads or British lads who have a much clearer understanding of what the club is about and the connection. Even if you're not brought up supporting that team, I still know what it's like to be, you know, United and yeah, Everton. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I think that was a big factor. And that's actually a, a law issue. We can't, I don't know how you get that back. I know there's been a restriction now, Simon, hasn't on the, you have to have X amount of homegrown yes. in, in, the, yeah. in the squad. But that was definitely, I think, one of the biggest factors. Brexit changed it as well. Brexit yeah. as well. Because you, what you're trying to do is educate lads who are coming from a different country sure. into what it means to this community and how football um, brings everybody together and... Although there might be similar but things. But they get it, Danny. And footballers, the and footballers get, and footballers get a lot. I give footballers a lot of stick because I've seen the other side of the argument and I've seen what footballers are capable of. But I've also seen what footballers are capable of on the good side. We forget to remember these footballers go out and do some fabulous things. They do. When you see journeys like Jermaine Defoe with Bradley Lowry, when you see kids going out to hospices, football yeah, players, yeah. 
That side doesn't get reported so much because yeah. it's not interesting. We like a doom doom culture. Don't I we? wish you'd been on the morning, Russell. We we had uh, Sir Alan Sugar on with us, and we were talking about <laughs> the prospect of fans in boardrooms. He <laughs> he leapt on it and let's say it's a hard no from Lord Sugar. It I'm was guessing. a hard no from Lord Sugar. It's a hard yes from us to having you in here today. We're going to talk about your tour, which is going to come uh, very shortly. In fact, it's underway now, and I know where you're going to be all around the country. You're going to mention some of these uh, venues and dates as well, Russell. Great having you on board it's coming up to half 12 Jim White and Simon Jordan Monday to Thursday morning 10 till 1 on AM on DAB via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker TalkSport